started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the 27th Annual uh, Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum and Expo, or Expo and Policy Forum. I will, I will alternate between which one I say first over the course of the day, but they're the same thing. I'm Dan Bursett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Um, this is the 20th, 27th of these that we've had, and it's great to be back on the House side here in the Gold Room. If you haven't yet stopped by our exhibit space, uh, that's over in the Rayburn foyer, just to, kind of around the corner. We have an absolutely jam-packed day, um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that this is our biggest expo, 27th of, of all, but uh, ESI is actually celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. Uh, and I got to say, the expo is kind of our bread and butter. It's, it's, you know, we do a lot of stuff at ESI, but policymaker education, congressional education is, is really what we're all about. And it's so great to be here today. And thank you to everyone in the room. Thank you to everyone in our live cast uh, for joining us. Um, we have seven panels here in the policy forum. We're going to start in just a moment with energy efficiency, which, if you know anything about emissions reductions, you always want to start with energy efficiency. Uh, so there's a reason for that, that we're starting there. Uh, but we have a tremendous amount of uh, experts. We have 35 total panelists across seven panels. Uh, we're going to be talking next about rural and tribal communities. We're going to be talking about energy system modernization. We're going to be talking about renewable energy, sustainable transportation. Uh, we're going to be talking about workforce. And we're going to be talking about national security and resilience. Um, the last of our panels today will wrap up at 4.45, and they'll start all on the hour or more or less on the hour. And then we have the exhibits. So we have about two dozen exhibitors over in the Rayburn foyer. I encourage everyone, if you haven't yet, to stop by. It's really great, uh, and it's a great opportunity to network. There'll also be a reception starting at 5 o'clock. So even if you can't uh, join us for all of the day, at least hopefully you'll be able to come back at 5 o'clock. I'm going to keep my remarks very, very short uh, because I want to get to our great panel. Um, we also have a very special guest joining us with a video intro. Um, we, one of the great things about getting to work on the expo is getting to work with the offices of Senator Jack Reed and Senator Mike Crapo, as well as Senator Chris Van Hollen and Senator Collins, and new this year, Representative Emanuel Cleaver II from Missouri. They are the co-chairs and vice co-chairs of the House and Senate, or Senate and House, respectively, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. Our friends with Senator Reed's office are here in the room. Uh, so thank you so much for all of the support. And it means a lot that Senator Reed is joining us today with a quick video intro, and then we'll get right to the show. My colleague, Dan O, is going to pull up the video and we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you. Hi, I'm Jack Reed, and I am pleased to welcome you to the 27th Annual Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo and Policy Forum. Let me start by recognizing Dan Brissett and his fantastic team at EESI for their hard work organizing this event. And thank you to all of the panelists and exhibitors for taking the time to lend their expertise and showcase their incredible work. As a co-chair of the Senate's Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, I work with Senator Mike Crapo of Idaho to increase awareness among our colleagues about new technologies that are transforming industry and our economy. I'm also pleased to have Representative Emanuel Cleaver join us in leading the caucus on the House side. Members of the caucus represent different parts of the country and belong to different political parties. But we all understand the importance of coming together to ensure Congress has the information it needs to make educated decisions about these issues. The facts are clear. Energy efficiency provides real results both for our wallets and for our environment. Indeed, the cheapest and cleanest form of energy is the energy we don't use. On the Senate Appropriations Committee, I have championed strong funding for the Weatherization Assistance Program and other initiatives that help boost energy efficiency and propel a clean energy future. In addition, I am working hard to ensure good implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act, a historic climate law Congress passed in 2022. The IRA invests about $370 billion in affordable, clean energy initiatives that will make America more energy independent, reduce emissions, and help people save thousands on their energy bills. 
but we can't get there without all of you. I hope today's conversations will inform and catalyze discussions as we chart a path towards a clean energy future. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy the expo. Thank you, Senator Reid, for joining us. I know you have a bill on the floor this week. Uh, it means a lot that you were still able to join us with some video welcome remarks. So thank you so much. It's really, really great to work with you and your great staff. And uh, same goes for Senator Crapo, Senator Van Hollen, Senator Collins, and Representative Cleaver. So that brings us, as Senator Reid said, that brings us to energy efficiency. Um, our format is going to be very straightforward. Each of our five great panelists will have about five minutes or so, and then we'll have a moderated Q&A. My friend Lindsay, I think, will have a microphone, and she'll uh, help us uh, take questions from the room. And of course, if you know ESI, we always have canned questions that are the softest of softballs. So if you have any good questions, just hang on until the end of our panel, and we'll be sure, we'll do our best to get to them. And if we can't, Hopefully, we'll have some opportunities to network, and you'll be able to come by the uh, exhibition space a little bit later. So that brings us to our first panelist of the day, not just of the panel, but of the day, Carolyn Snyder. Carolyn is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Buildings and Industry at the US Department of Energy. Carolyn, welcome, and I'm looking forward to your remarks. Dan, thank you so much, and a big thank you to your team for this amazing, active day full of inspiration um, to our panelists of industry leaders, great representation of the kind of American innovation that I think is so critical to our country's success and our, our future competitiveness, as well as the exhibitors today. Um, as Dan said, I'm Carolyn Snyder, and I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Energy, focusing on buildings and industry. I am part of the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office team. You'll be hearing from um, many, several of my colleagues later today around transportation, renewable energy, and the evolving grid. So please stick around for those topics as well. Um, so I'm going to do a rapid fire across the big sectors that I get to work on with roughly around nearly $800 million of R&D investments each year. For our building sector, we have an office solely focused on the innovations needed for our nation's buildings, our building technology office. And I think sometimes we can forget the R&D need that is so direly needed within our nation's building stocks. Um, to give you a quick you know, top stat estimates, we've got around a third of total US emissions um, are from our nation's buildings, over 100 million buildings. And around a 30% of the energy consumed in our buildings is wasted. The opportunity for savings and resilience and competitiveness um, and public health benefits are jaw-dropping. We recently released a national decarbonization blueprint for our nation's buildings. And not only are there emission savings, we also have over $100 billion in energy cost savings each year, $17 billion in annual health savings, and over a trillion dollars in investments in, ener in clean energy jobs. So working on buildings, working on energy efficiency, working on clean heat is critical to our nation's companies, our nation's families, but also really our competitiveness going forward and our, and our communities. I also want to touch on industry because similarly in industry, energy efficiency is more important than ever. And at the Department of Energy, we have a new office over the last two years that was created to solely focus on industrial energy efficiency as well as industrial emissions. We released a decarbonization roadmap thanks to our direction from our congressional colleagues several years ago. And we've been doing robust analysis and work with industry since then. Our office is structured and focused solely based on the feedback we heard from industry. So we now have national experts in the chemical industry, iron and steel, food and beverage, forest products, cement and concrete, data centers, and water and wastewater. And we know the pillars that are needed for US competitiveness are energy efficiency. Also, clean heat sources. Processed heat is roughly a half of the energy consumption in our nation's facilities. And we have to be talking about the grid integration challenge of these new large loads. So if you're thinking about where are our nation's um, best innovations and R&D needs that are responsive to the industries we need of the future, think of the ERE. Think of our new industrial office. Um, we now have a central coordinator of experts across the whole agency in that office. And then lastly, I want to talk about manufacturing. I think we are in this incredible moment of a lifetime um, 
for U.S. renaissance in manufacturing. We are reinvesting in our nation's manufacturing facilities across the country. We're rebuilding communities that depend on those manufacturing facilities. And we're doing it in a way that has cleaner air and water associated with it, that is creating well-paid jobs and is helping create resilience in our energy system and increasing our U.S. competitiveness and security of those supply chains. We have an office solely focused on the advanced materials and the advanced manufacturing processes that are required for all of U.S. industry, not just clean energy transitions. And to give you a taste of the kinds of investments in that space, we're talking about smart manufacturing. We just released a FOA um, for $33 million in that space. We're talking about additive manufacturing with our longstanding collaborations with our national labs. Circularity, I would like to challenge us as a panel. Energy efficiency is more important than ever, but as is material efficiency and water efficiency and the ability to work across those spaces to meet the needs of US companies and our communities. And lastly, we get to work with leaders across our country through our better buildings, better plants, and better climate initiatives. And that's a great example to me how DOE, yes, we are the leaders in funding um, and helping seed fund R&D across our country, but we're also helping scale those technologies, working with partners like some of those on uh, the panel today. And to give you examples of the kinds of savings that result from that partnership, we estimate $18 billion in energy savings from our Better Buildings program, three quads of energy use. And we also have our Better Climate Challenge with over 160 companies right now committing to reduce their emissions and their energy use. And it was really great designing that challenge because what was non-negotiable was energy efficiency from the beginning. Um, we also have increased assistance across the country. We have regional on-site energy, technical assistance partnerships, helping companies address clean heat and energy efficiency needs, as well as our most recent um, Buildings Upgrade Prize, helping communities across the country scale building retrofits. And I know that'll be a topic mm -hmm. later today. So with that, I'll just quickly wrap up. I want us, when we think about energy efficiency, yes, it's energy savings. Yes, it's cost savings and helping affordability. But it is also rebuilding U.S. industry, national competitiveness. It's shoring up national security, our nation's supply chains, and it's creating healthier and more resilient communities for families across the country. So thank you for making the time to be part of this panel. Thank you for starting the day with <laughs> energy efficiency. Um, and with that, I'll hand it to my next panel. Great. Thank you. Well, if I didn't, Kurt would swipe at me. So I, I know better <laughs> than to not start with energy efficiency. Um, it also delivers things like comfort, resilience, things like that. And that's something that our next panelist and two, actually two panelists, will talk a little bit about. That brings us to Kurt Rich. Kurt is the president and CEO of the North American Insulation Manufacturers Association. Kurt, always great to see you. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Dan. And I didn't tell you what I was going to talk about. I'm going to, because if I told you, you'd squash me. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk about energy codes. And I want to spend five minutes talking about energy codes. And the reason I want to do that is because they, they, energy codes have really been under attack this Congress. Energy codes have been blamed in congressional hearings and through congressional press releases for the high cost of housing. They've been blamed for efforts by the government to drive electrification and, and reduce natural gas usage. And they've been, uh, they've been uh, uh, held up as, as, as an effort by, uh, by an international organization to, uh, to impose its will on, on the United States. And uh, I, I just want to kind of uh, address each of those, uh, each of those claims and, 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 uh, and dispel the myths. So first, let's, let's begin with, with the easiest, and that's no, the energy codes are, are not part of an international cabal. Yes, it's called the International Energy Conservation Code. That's the, the energy code that, uh, that is applied for residential construction in the United States. But it is a U.S.-based voluntary effort uh, where every three years stakeholders get together, uh, builders, energy raters, uh, code officials, state energy offices, manufacturers, efficiency advocates, and in a consensus process, they, they arrive at a, at a position and it's voted on and a, and a new code is updated. And then, then the states are able to... Uh, 
are, are able to adopt that code and make modifications to it. The magic behind the, the code and its, its update every three years is that a home built in to the 2021 IECC is 40% more efficient than a code built to the 2006 IECC. So it's really a success story that over the, the course now of about 20 years, we've seen that kind of efficiency improvement uh, through the code. The second myth I wanted to dispel is that energy codes drive electrification. Energy codes are, are fuel neutral. Uh, you, can, you can build a home that uses uh, gas fire generation, uh, natural gas, uh, coal fire generation, or renewable generation. The energy code doesn't speak to that. You have total flexibility on how you want to heat, cool your home or, or, or the cook, cooking surface that you want to use. The code is agnostic. It does not drive electrification. And then finally, the biggest and I think the most impactful critique is that the energy code is responsible for the high cost of, of, of housing in the United States. Now, make no mistake, you know, the price of homes is, has really gotten out of control. It's, it is very high, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But the primary reason is, is, is obviously high interest rates, uh, but beyond that, we have, have high, uh, uh, we, we have high land costs. Uh, we do have high material costs across the board, uh, including materials that really aren't, aren't impacted by, by the efficiency code. And then, and I don't think a lot of people think about this, but, but kind of customer demands for housing for what their homes look like just aren't the same as they were 20 years ago. Customers want fancier kitchens, nicer, uh, ni nicer bathrooms. They want 12-foot ceilings. There are just a lot of demands that... Uh, uh, they go into the modern house and, and, and drive up efficiency, or drive up uh, the cost of housing. So let's look and see what, kind of what, a, what the energy code does to the, to the cost of housing. If, let's take a, a home in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for example. If, if you build that home, and, and Pennsylvania is currently on the 2025 energy code. So if you built that home in, in Pittsburgh to the 2021 IECC, that homeowner would then, or home purchaser then, then would probably have to bring about $450 more to, to settlement for their, for their uh, down payment on that home. Their mortgage would go up because of that additional cost. It'd go up about $50 a year, or $50 a month. So they'd be, they would be paying more for that increased efficiency in their home. But their utility bill for heating and cooling would go down $350 a year. Year after year after year, you would save $350. So really what the energy code does is it drives down the cost of home ownership of which, yes, the mortgage is one part of it, but so too are those operating expenses that include heating and cooling. You know, for all of us in this room, if you, if you buy a home, particularly a new home, chances are that that builder is going to market that home as being green or highly energy efficient. And when they use those words, you're just going to assume that that home is built to the most current energy code. When the fact of the matter is, it's pr probably not. It's probably going to be built to the 2006 or the 2009 code, a code that's nearly 20 years outdated. So what policies like the new mortgage requirements that were just announced by the federal, federal uh, FHA and, and USDA do is they basically put a warranty on homes that they say new home purchasers, particularly at entry level homes, if you buy this home, you have an assurance through the requirement of, of, of model uh, of requiring the most updated code uh, be complied with on those homes, you have an assurance that the home that you are buying is highly energy efficient and that you are gonna save on your utility bills. For the, uh, for the duration of, 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 of your time in that home. So again, I just think the hyperbole around energy codes has really kind of gotten contorted, and there's a great story to tell about energy efficiency driven through energy codes that are not only pro-environment, but really are pro-family. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. I had no problem with any of that, Kurt. That sounds great. I love energy codes. Uh, in fact, one of the best ways to get brownie points during an ESI briefing is to start talking about building energy codes. So you're off to a great start. 
Uh, that brings us to Justin Kosher. Justin is the president of the Polyisocyanurate Insulation Manufacturers Association. Justin, welcome to the expo today. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for having Pima. You're one of the few that aren't part of the industry that goes for the whole polyisocyanurate <laughs> in the introduction. <laughs> I just um, have to say. But happy to be here. Happy that energy efficiency is the first panel. Um, I think it's also noteworthy that you have two representatives from the insulation industry on this panel, and I think that speaks to uh, the importance of uh, the building envelope when we talk about building performance, but also even in Senator Reed's comments about new technologies, the envelope is such a critical part about enabling the success of those technologies. It's often forgotten. We always get caught up in the fancy new object, uh, but it's the one thing that really can catalyze the success of those other technologies, whether it be heat pumps or the deployment of distributed um, energy like rooftop solar. Um, it all really starts with a strong building thermal envelope, and that's what um, the companies that Kurt and I represent are in the business of. Um, Pima, uh, we manufacture polyiso insulation. It's a board insulation, more commonly used in commercial construction. Uh, our biggest application is commercial roofing. So if you're in a building with a flat roof, like the Rayburn office building, chances are it has polyiso on that roof. Um, we operate 41 plants across North America. Uh, speaking to Carolyn's comments about manufacturing um, renaissance since 2022, we've opened up plants in Maryland, Texas, uh, Missouri, and the 41st plant just opened up this uh, year in Peru, uh, Illinois. So definitely a recognition of the demand for our uh, products as well as speaking to um, the fact that the U.S. is a great place to, to do business and, and manufacture. I'll second Kurt's comments on energy codes. Those same energy codes, when you look at commercial buildings, are widely accepted and adopted as minimum standards. In fact, I think in the commercial sector, they really are just that, the minimum floor. We always talk about the energy code just like the building code. If you build to the energy code, that's legally the worst building that you can build. Um, on the commercial side, I think that's true. There's other market drivers that incentivize building owners to go beyond that minimum code, whether it be corporate commitments or the marketability of programs like LEED uh, that really let you market and upsell those uh, enhancements in building performance. But I think it's very interesting, given Kurt's comments, to kind of draw that distinction between the role that energy codes play on the commercial side um, and how they've been held out as a boogeyman on the residential side. Um, but I want to spend a few minutes, I know we'll get into it with our next question, on existing buildings. Um, I know there's various stats, but one that I like to look at is uh, the stat that says 80% of the buildings that we'll have in 2050 are already built. So we can't build a more sustainable future. We've got to do something about existing buildings, and they present very unique challenges uh, when compared to new construction. One reason we care about existing buildings so much is that most roofs that we put on a commercial building each year go on existing buildings, you know, anywhere from 60 to 70, 80 percent, depending on the market conditions of new construction, roofs are going on existing buildings. And you know, why do roofs matter? Roofs are the most frequent envelope alteration that has an impact on energy efficiency, uh, but too many times we're not doing enough to leverage that um, opportunity, and I think it speaks to a number of the challenges uh, that we have uh, with existing building renovation. Um, those of you in the policy world, you may have heard the concept of zero over time. Uh, the idea that you're improving a building when parts run out or parts fail or reach their service life. Uh, I think the, the barrier to that is it, it requires some sophisticated planning and resources. Um, and I think federal policy has a really critical role in solving those two issues, uh, the planning aspect and the resource aspect. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act did a lot of good things to draw attention to the role um, and the need for increased investments in energy efficiency, whether it be um, things like 179D or some of the direct investment. Uh, but more needs to be done to drive resources to existing buildings. The problem is when some of these opportunities present themselves, it might be in an emergency. Um, the fact is you as even homeowners probably don't think about your roof until it leaks. Probably the same thing can be said for most commercial buildings. You're not thinking about the opportunity until it fails, and then when it fails, depending on what business you're trying to operate in there, that may be a serious problem. And you're probably focused on getting the roof to not leak and moving forward and not really leveraging that opportunity. Um, so 
giving um, building owners the opportunity to access resources at that critical time when it makes the most sense um, is very important. Planning as well. I think we'll probably talk a little bit about building performance standards when we're really excited about those, um, primarily because I think it's going to get building owners to think differently about managing their assets mm -hmm. um, and to look for these opportunities that will naturally come up in that building's, um, that building's service life. And then I think we'll also touch on um, workforce, um, whether that be a um, lack of skilled uh, workers in the construction trades, whether it be um, local building departments that have half the staff that they used to have and probably have twice as much construction going on in that jurisdiction, um, or whether it just be um, making sure that the design, um, design professionals have the um, education they need to uh, focus on existing buildings. So I'll leave it at that and pass it on. Thank you, Justin. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about uh, retrofits and existing buildings. And that brings us to Tim Unruh. Tim is the exec executive director of the National Association of Energy Service Companies. Tim, always great to see you. Take it away. Thanks, Dan. And I'm not talking about insulation. Great job. Um, so, so I'm with the National Association of Energy Service Companies. We are a group of, tra we're a trade association. We're a group of companies that do energy retrofits of existing buildings primarily. A little bit of new buildings, but mostly existing buildings. And our work is done primarily in the public building space, which we think is probably about 25% of all the buildings. Uh, we have members that are energy service companies, ESCOs. And those companies are the construction companies that implement, that they develop, implement, and then have to monitor and oversee the installation for anywhere from 10, 15, 20, 25, and sometimes even longer years. Uh, the an energy savings performance contract is our primary vehicle that we use to do this work. And that's a vehicle where the energy service company audits a site, determines what types of things can be done to renovate the site and what can be done to improve it. They work with the owner to come up with a package, put that together. The owner and the energy service company determine how that is financed, and they will bring in various sources of money to make that happen. And then the energy service company has to guarantee the savings of that project, both the energy savings and any operational savings over the life of the project through an annual measurement and verification process. If the savings come short, the energy service company has to make up the difference so that the loan payment can continue to be made without any impact on the government's budgets. As we work with primary public buildings, uh, we have to have enabling legislation. And so we have laws at the federal government and in all 50 states that uh, govern how our work is done. And uh, at the federal government, uh, the primary program that oversees that is the Federal Energy Management Program, which used to report to a group that Carolyn worked for. Now it's over in the S3 area over in FEMP. Uh, it's called FEMP, the Federal Energy Management Program, over in S3 at Department of Energy. But the Federal Energy Management Program, I ran that program for six years where we did work in federal buildings, renovating those buildings for energy efficiency and making improvements. One of the things we find as we do energy efficiency in these buildings is that we don't just change the energy efficiency building, but we change the occupant comfort and the, uh, the, the, the enjoyment of these, these buildings and, and the internal environment, um, uh, it's internal environmental conditions of these buildings. Because the employees in the buildings, when you have a properly functioning heat and ventilation air conditioning system, enjoy the building better, they, they have more productivity. And so when you do energy efficiency, you're not just thinking about efficiency, but there's a holistic approach to how the overall building works. When we look at the market that we, we work in, we work in buildings all across the spectrum. So federal buildings are about 25% of what we do. And then K through 12 schools are also about 25% of what we do. And that's a pretty big market for us. Overall, we work at about eight to $9 billion a year. Uh, we see about a 15% growth each year in our market as we continue to expand. One of the things that, that we primarily do are building retrofits like heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Uh, we do building envelope quite often. Roofs are quite often done. Uh, we do water efficiency. Uh, but beyond that, we also do things that are outside the normal. Uh, you know, we do lighting and all those things you normally think of efficiency. But our members also come in and do things like decarbonization. They'll do electrification. Uh, they often get involved in doing microgrids and trying to work out backup power and negotiating with the utility. So, so the, the work is quite broad. Than, than just a straight efficiency project. And often they come in taking a holistic look at the building over what all can we do to this building in order to make its overall cost structure go down, make its resiliency increase, and help make the occupants more satisfied with their working space. 
The challenge that we have, the biggest part, is limited funding. While our projects work on this savings model, where the savings funds the projects, our desires as building owners have changed dramatically over the past few years, and we're expecting the building after a retrofit to do more than it did before. So where before, we might not have built the building with resiliency in mind, we might not have built it with decarbonization, electrification, any of those things, but all of a sudden now we're demanding those for our future buildings. We, we wouldn't think of doing a renovation of a building that's a critical asset, which many of the public buildings are, without thinking about resiliency and how we can make sure that we have uninterrupted power to the sites. And so the, the challenge we face is, is that when we're limited on funding, building funding in the public sector is not exactly the flashy thing that politicians want to vote for. And funding for public buildings almost always takes either a voter referendum in schools, maybe approve a bond issue, or it takes a council to approve, or it may take an elected official to approve in some way, shape, or form. And so in some ways, it always comes back to a public decision. People like to build new things more than they like to fix the old things. And so you know, coming in and making sure that we have the proper funding is one of the primary challenges that I think our efficiency industry faces. And then finally, uh, when we talk about a holistic view of the building, I also want to think about a holistic view of the funding. The Inflation Reduction Act has certainly added a whole new twist to my industry. I'm hearing between 40 and 50% of all the work being developed is, is a combination of Inflation Reduction Act and other funding. If we can leverage the existing funds from utility rebates to capital budgets, instead of putting them into silos and doing separate work for each one of those, bring them all together, we find that we can accomplish far more than we did before. In other words, $1 plus $1 might actually equal about $2.5 worth of retrofits in the building if you combine the funding. Great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, that was great. Um, now we are going to hear from Kelly Raymond and hear about some of the, uh, the cool gadgets that keep us cool in our homes. And Daikin has some of the coolest ones, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Kelly is the Senior Director, Sustainability and Environmental Advocacy at Daikin. Kelly, this is your first uh, time at the Expo, I think, Daikin. So thanks again. And you're one of the organizations that's also exhibiting. So if you like what Kelly has to say, go check out her booth afterwards. She'll be around. Take it away. Well, I'll say it's my first time up here, but not my first time being in the audience. So I know what it's like to sit through the seven panels in the day. Um, <laughs> and you guys are in for a treat. I'll keep it short. Um, so as Dan mentioned, uh, I'm with Daikin US. Uh, we have a location here in DC. And uh, we're, what I like to say is Daikin is the largest manufacturer in the HVAC space you've never heard of. So we are a world leader in air conditioning, ventilation, air filtration, um, heating, refrigeration uh, equipment, but we're not as well known in the US. Um, globally, we are hitting our 100 year anniversary. Um, we have more than 89,000 employees, 175 countries, uh, more than 125 production bases. And here in the US, we're growing. We're more than 22,000 employees and 25 production bases now. So um, we've got a, a significant footprint now. Um, and uh, since I had colleagues that I knew were going to be touching today on the building envelope, I thought I'd touch a little bit on equipment. Um, it's a phrase that wasn't coined by me, but advanced energy group, they throw an a energy efficiency forum every year, and they coined the phrase heat pumpification. Um, and it meant something to us because heat pumps is one of the things that we're focused on for our uh, Daikin Environmental Vision 2050. We're one of the companies that has a net zero goal to meet by 2050. We're trying to meet our first reduction of 30% by 2025. And that is going to be key is that heat pumpification, how we can ensure that we're giving the best uh, quality, high efficiency products um, throughout our customer base um, to ensure that we're reducing our emissions throughout our life cycle. Um, so that's, that's key to our goals. Um, as a, a little bit of a, a stat, in 2020, 80% uh, of the world's heating and hot water supply systems all used fossil fuel combustion or electric heating. And heat pumps accounted for 5%. Um, so heat pumps are something that you've heard about. They've been around for a long time. They're growing, but they've actually been a very small portion of the HVAC equipment uh, globally. Uh, they're growing a lot faster in some of the places where you see energy costs higher, you know, Asia, Europe, but they are continuing to grow here in the U.S. Um, Daikin has sold over 230 million uh, heat pump units globally, so there, there's certainly a good demand that's been growing there. Um, and they've been proven by the U.S. Department of Energy to be three times more efficient than furnaces that burn fossil fuels while not sacrificing comfort. 
Uh, that's something we've been participating in as well as Department of Energy's Coal Climate Heat Pump Challenge, trying to create more efficient heat pumps that operate without sacrificing comfort at negative 15 Fahrenheit, um, something that we want to be able to make available in the market among our other competitors. Um, heating and cooling homes, buildings, and water, it accounts for more than 40% of the U.S. energy consumption. So this is a space for energy efficiency that we cannot ignore. Um, a lot of equipment manufacturers, including Daikin in particular, think that the adoption of variable speed inverter technology is also going to be the clear way for the U.S. to accelerate our progress in meeting ambitious emission reduction goals. If uh, you haven't seen an inverter uh, before, it's a special kind of compressor, and it operates a little differently. It basically modulates the amount of power versus turning off and on. So you're talking about a system that uh, gives you sometimes greater comfort because it's continuously operating, keeping you at a steady heat or cooling, but um, gives you lower power usage and a lower environmental impact because it's able to get away from having to um, turn off and on and continually try to recool a home or heat. Uh, your traditional heating systems that rely on fossil fuels or electric resistance heat, they can operate to 80 to 99% per efficiency, and that probably sounds really, really good. Um, but a heat pump can operate at 500% efficiency. So that means they're able to generate five more times energy than the energy that's used by the equipment, and that helps reduce your consumptions and costs, and so we think that that's critical to the, the market right now. Um, on a, a slightly personal note, one of the most exciting things I've been able to do since coming to Daikin was help lead a project where our team moved our offices and uh, we do have a space now that is built to help show people how heat pumps work, um, help con do consumer education, policy education, talk about everything from our refrigerant transition to um, we have a cold room you can step in, get a nice um, what we call Minnesota chill. It gets down to 8 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is really nice this time of year. And you can <laughs> see how it's still creating heat despite that cool environment that it's in. So um, we invite you guys to come and join. Uh, our offices, it's always available for tours, and please feel free to stop by our booth in the foyer. Very cool. Thank you. And I've been in the little chamber. It gets really cold in there, and that heat pump is chugging along. So, great. So, my friend Lindsay here has a microphone, and she'll make her way around the audience if I see any hands pop up. But to kick us off, I'd like to come back to something that Justin said. Justin sort of insinuated that we had canned questions, and of course we do, in fact. Um, and Carolyn, I'd like to start with, us one, I start, start with you on this one, and maybe we can go down through the line. I'd like to build out the idea a little bit of sort of how, the, how we might address energy efficiency differently in new versus existing buildings, and what are the different policy tools that might be more appropriate for new versus existing buildings, and do we have enough of those policy solutions? Are there bipartisan ones that we should be pursuing? Thanks for that, Dan. I would say um, Justin kicked us off well. The, the buildings of 2050, the vast majority are the buildings we are in today. And to me, that was the biggest gut punch from our work on the national building blueprint. To achieve our goals of a 50% um, reduction in energy use intensity and a 75% reduction in on-site emissions by 2050, we have to be focused on existing buildings. And retrofits can be really hard. Um, we're currently not only have the historic investments from Bill and IRA, and a big thank you for those of you in the room who are part of making that um, massive investment in our energy system. We also are investing over $7 billion every year through ratepayer funded programs in energy efficiency. And all that together gets us to 1% to 2% retrofits a year. That is not the rate we need to be on to achieve our national goals. Um, some estimates show, you know, tenfold, hundredfold in some cases of um, retrofit scales that we need to be achieving across market segments. So at DOE, we've really flipped our focus of R&D to really be on solutions that, yes, can help new construction, but that are addressing the retrofit challenges. Things like our cold climate heat pump challenge, we have an envelope prize, a commercial rooftop accelerator, um, a robot prize around addressing air sealing and insulation challenges. So really bringing the full force of American innovation to this question of how do we achieve scale. Um, and then one last reflection I, I want to add is um, another humbling moment in our country, which is that over 20% of households in the United States were unable to pay an energy bill in full in 2022. And that motivated our affordable home energy earth shot at DOE, where we need to reduce um, the retrofit costs by over 50% in the communities that need those savings the most. 
insulation and energy efficiency is lacking in these communities, in these homes. The air quality implications result in asthma rates that are estimated to be twice the national average among black children. So when we're talking about the challenges of envelope and insulation and equipment efficiency numbers, that might seem really wonky, but it makes a huge difference to the people in our communities. And I'm so grateful for the um, leadership from those on the panel. Great, thanks. Kurt? Staying on my energy code theme, uh, you know, there, there's only one opportunity to, to really get it right when it comes to energy efficiency particularly for homes, and that's at the time of construction. Uh, you, know, you can build a, 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 a tight envelope, well insulated, uh, great windows, but after that building's built, or that home is built, it's, yeah, you can put more insulation in your, in your attic, but it's just not cost effective to go in and do a whole home energy retrofit for, for a home. You look at what's happening right now, about half of the country is on energy codes that are 20 years or older. So about 50% of all new homes built in the United States are under insulated. That means that 50% of new homes built each year are automatically qualified for state weatherization programs, for the 25C energy efficiency home retrofit tax credit. Uh, you know, so we, kind of a perverse, uh, a perverse incentive that we have going on here, that we are building homes that from the first moment of occupancy are, are not energy efficient, and then, uh, then become basically our, our, our retrofit challenge of the future. Adding to that stack of 140 million homes that, that need to be, uh, need energy efficiency improvements, so. Thanks. Justin? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm pretty, I'm bullish on the trajectory of policy on the existing building side, especially on commercials, because I think back just a couple of years ago when uh, cities were adopting benchmarking ordinances, so you had to measure and in some cases report your energy use, and that received a ton of pushback. But now we're in the phase of actually doing something with that information. So it's widely accepted that commercial buildings should be measuring and reporting. You can't, you know, you can't fix what you don't measure. Um, so just in a couple of short periods of time, we've overcome that uh, resistance to looking at our performance, and we're on, I think, an upward trajectory of doing something about that performance. So I think maybe hopefully in five years' time, you know, we'll be talking about building performance standards as a, a widely accepted policy across the country. Tim? Yeah, so Carolyn, thank you for pointing out that existing buildings are hard. Uh, my, my industry works primarily in existing buildings, and uh, it's challenging. You can uh, think you have everything planned, and then the, you pull out the design specs that you think are for the building, and it turns out that the contractor built something different but never updated the as-builds. And so all of a sudden, your project is thrown into a race. So updating existing buildings is challenging, and I'm going to come back to the same theme. It costs a lot of money especially with our expectations growing with, with resiliency, with, with decarbonization, electrification. Those things are taking more money than what we can generate in savings, and so we have to think about the funding programs. And certainly the IRA has provided a vast sum of money for these public buildings with the direct pay option that they can get that money directly and fund their projects, but it's still a challenge because the timing of the IRA funding is very difficult to achieve in many cases because you have to completely build your project then apply for a tax credit number, and then actually apply for tax credit, and then wait for to receive it. And so it could be a year after you finished your project and paid all of your contractors before the money actually comes in. So challenges in that area are real, and they have to be financed. There's no other way around it. And so sometimes you think about a, a poor rural school district, and they come in and they want to do a new system, and they have a natural gas boiler, and to update to a ground source heat pump system is a very costly approach, the IRA offers a significant amount of funding, but the financing may be daunting for them, and they may be scared of that, that risk of that one-year wait. And so we have a lot of challenges there that I think policy can help us improve. Thanks. Kelly? Uh, since my colleagues touched on a lot of it, I'll just add, um, you know, for the IRA incentives, just thinking about policies that already ex exist, 
it's a little tough to say how it's going to shake out right now um, as far as effectiveness, because it's just taken a little while for the money to get in some of the communities that need it, especially for heat pumps if you're thinking in the residential market. Those were going to states who had to come up with their own individual programs. Some states were very prepared. New York is an example. They had a great clean heat program that they were able to kind of amend and, and be able to set it up. Some states, they have like an energy office of one. So it's gonna take them a little while to be ready. And so it's gonna be a bit before we see how effective that policy measure has been, whether looking at newer existing buildings for those communities that would have access to those funds. Um, I will add though, I, I think that, um, you know, whether you're looking at new buildings or existing, uh, I think that it's important to look at one policy measure that benefits them both. And that for us would be demand flexibility. Um, products of today are not the products of yesterday. And when you think about demand response as a policy, that has been viewed very negatively. When you get that letter from some electric utility says, would you like to give us control to turn off of your equipment whenever we need in order to balance our grid? A lot of people are thinking to themselves, no. Um, you know, and I can understand for sure, a senior community might say to themselves, we need to have cooling on the hottest day. We need to have heat on the, on the coldest day. I am not willing to have somebody, you know, turn my system off to balance the grid. And I 100% get that need. Um, so demand flexibility is really important. It's one of the reasons we like inverter equipment, which again, a lot of manufacturers make. It allows you to send a signal to maybe operate the system at 10% less or 20% less, and they might never feel a comfort difference. Um, but you would, you would still continue to be able to have that ability to balance the grid. And so I think grid modernization as a policy is going to be critical. Great. Thanks. And we'll talk a little bit more of that uh, in some future panels. And that's where that inverter technology really comes in handy. I'm scanning the audience for any questions. We have one here in the second row. Or, or, well, I guess third row, fourth row. I don't know. I can't count. Hi. Thanks. Uh, Tristan Bannon with uh, Lightos Engineering. So the power sector, the utilities, if you look across the several thousand investor-owned municipal co-ops, uh, they almost uniformly have some version of an energy efficiency rebate program. And these programs are largely paid for in, in the rate base and um, are also very disaggregated, but represent what I think is a pretty overlooked kind of layer of the cost stack. Uh, so I'm interested in, in the panel here, um, lots of different opinions, I imagine. How can these programs maybe be unified around a national strategy for energy efficiency to decarbonize housing, industrial sector, uh, you know, residential, you know, commercial, healthcare, et cetera, uh, in a way maybe more effectively than we've done today? Thank you. Thanks. Um, comments from the panel on you, how to bring utility programs into alignment? I don't know. Kurt and I have talked. We should have a Got Milk campaign <laughs> for these types of things. Even us in the industry, I mean, if you've gone to try and access those rebates, you have got to be dedicated to wanting to get it, if you even know about it. Um, and I know what, when the IRA came out, we thought this is a great opportunity to educate people on what it is the IRA is doing, but also what is already available and to ease that path. I think it also starts with contractor mm -hmm. education. They're probably the conduit that most homeowners are going to learn about these things. Um, but I don't think there's even that knowledge base in the contractor um, sector to know how to use those in their businesses. Yeah. It may be just a real world experiment. So uh, example, so a couple of months ago, just to kind of see how the industry was, 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 was shifting in light of the Inflation Reduction Act, I brought in a home energy performance contractor. They did a blower door test of my home, went around, poked around in my attic. Uh, and then I sat down with them and I began to talk to them about, well, you know, when these, when these state rebate programs come, on, come online, you know, how will that interact with my uh, Delmarva Power uh, utility incentives that might be available? And, and what about my 25C tax credit? And at that point, he was just like, look, I got no idea. I, I have no idea how any of these works. So to Justin's point, it's market education. You know, it's an incredible opportunity out there to stack, leverage all of these different incentives, but the public doesn't know how to do it, and the the service providers, the contractor base, they don't know how to describe it. So, mm -hmm. uh, Kelly, Tim, Carolyn, any comment on the rebate question? I would just say that you've um, eloquently described the problem statement for our building's upgrade prize motivation, and so what we're looking at is investing in 45 programs across the country of 
how do we get the seeds of innovation scaling across all those different programs? And that's everything from um, contractor education, outreach, um, procurement elements, that's best practices in program design, that's financing. Sometimes there's technology solutions, so it's going back to the R&D element, um, but it's a real focus of ours. I'll also share um, just a pivot of connecting your, your question to, to Kelly's earlier comments. The, the world of the grid edge is a huge part of um, future discussions. And I'll just say, for those of you who only could come to one panel, congratulations, you came to the right one. Because 75% of our nation's electricity use is in buildings. So if you want to talk about power, come talk about buildings. The vast majority of our nation's EV chargers are through buildings. So if you want to talk about the challenges with electrifying transportation, you came to the right place. As Dan said, if you want to talk about resilience, national security. And we at Department of Energy have rolled out a much more comprehensive and integrated portfolio to support the kind of planning and decision making and technology validation that needs to happen at that space of the grid edge, including our newest connected communities FOA for $85 million, as well as technical assistance support and capacity fellows who are in commissions and in um, munis and co-ops, helping them plan better and helping them better quantify the benefits of energy efficiency so that we can do better in our program design, but also have better funding for scaling those programs. Great, all right. Tim, you get the last word, I think, unless Kelly has something. All right, so on the rebate programs, uh, um, my members often would like to access rebates. And there's, there's a great database, the Desire database, DSIRE, is a great system to go find out what rebates are available in the state. The, the challenge is that there's so much uncertainty around a rebate program with the utility. If I'm going to go through the administrative burden to fill out all their forms and answer all of their questions, am I going to get approved and then what's the time frame I'm going to get approved? And if I do get approved, what's my time frame of receiving payment? And then what do I have to do after the project to validate that my payment was justified? All those things add a lot of uncertainty to the program. And so a lot of rebates sit on the table because of that uncertainty, because the project is moving. And if all of a sudden one piece of that project that may be a, a minor funding component in many cases, causes a delay, that delay can cost more than the rebate is worth. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, well, we're gonna call it there um, because uh, we have a very special guest zooming in. I'd like to say, Kelly, Tim, Justin, Kurt, and Carolyn, thank you so much. I, I might take a little issue, like if you're gonna come with one, because all of our next five panelists are already here. So they're gonna, it's also gonna be a really good panel, 11 o'clock, but. Come to all thank of you. them. Thank you for being uh, the kickoff panel of the 27th annual Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expert. Thank you. <laughs>